You see James, who is the, the author of this epistle, was a pastor himself. <clears throat> and as you know from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, we have the fourfold ministry, or the fourfold uh, gifts to the church. We sometimes call them fivefold, but actually they are fourfold. It depends with which school you have come from. <laughs> I, I call them fourfold because uh, the Bible starts or posters by saying it is He that gave some to be apostles, others prophets, others evangelists, others pastors and teachers. It doesn't say others to be pastors and others to be teachers. So teacher, pastor, teacher seem to be sharing the same portfolio in that passage of scripture. And therefore James being a pastor, he was also a teacher. And James, I'm sure you have been told from the previous speakers, was a brother to our Lord Jesus Christ. And James, he had such a heart to be a pastor, an elder, and sometimes we give him the title of bishop, which is very much misused today. Everybody, at least in Kenya, wants to be referred to as bishop. Not knowing that bishop simply means elder. <laughs> but we, we, we put a lot of emphasis on the title of a bishop to the extent that you may think bishop is the second God we have. But actually bishop simply means elder. So James is qualified to be called bishop because he was an elder. But in order for us to understand this passage, I want, us, I want to give you a general overview of what James is talking about here. James is not saying that the tongue cannot be tamed or cannot be controlled. That is not what James is saying. He's not saying that the tongue is a very evil member of our body that we cannot tame it or control it. James is saying that the tongue is a very small member of our body and no one has been able to control it. Not that it cannot be controlled, but no one has been able to control it. Let me begin by asking you a few questions, but don't answer me. Just think about them. <laughs> Have you ever heard people say things that they regret later for saying them? <laughs> Have you ever heard people say words that are abominable against other people Maybe cursing them or trying to bring them down. Have you ever had Christian leaders, especially in Kenya, from one divide of political side, cursing a leader from another divide of the political side? Yes. And the same from the other side to the other side. If you ask me which of the leaders that are being compared, which one is better, I will tell you none. But people from this political divide, they want to look at their person, their political leader, as a God person. Even though he may be having so much evil. And the people from the other divide, the leader from the other divide may also be equally evil. But because people from that tribe, they want to make their pastor look like an angel, 
They want to demonize or make the other leader look as if he's the devil himself. It happens in Kenya. I think it also happens elsewhere in the world. The last question. Have you yourself ever found yourself clicking and cursing people because of what they might have done to you or said against you? Have you ever felt like telling somebody, go to hell, and yet you're a Christian leader? Have you ever felt like uttering words that are not worth to come out of a mouth of a Christian? Let me give you an example. In Nairobi, traffic is hectic. <laughs> And this morning, I went to my office by 5.30 in the morning. I prepared myself. When I was ready to leave, the person who had the custodian of the key to the car I was to use came to me and said, sorry, I forgot my office key at home and the car key is in my office. So I don't know how you're going to go. I told her, don't worry, I can use my own car. But she came to me when I was just outside waiting for that kid to be brought to me. Time wasting. Could I have cast her? No. I came to the road, and just as I was getting out of my office, there, the heavy traffic jam was. And I say, will I make it? And then I came. But this is what I wanted to tell you. One evening, two people were driving on the road. And as you know, Kenyans are very rough drivers. Everyone wants to find his way ahead of the other. And so there was this guy, gentleman, who was blocking the other person's car so that the other person cannot move. And when the other person got some time, he went the other side and he told him, you are very stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy in the other car realized the person telling him you are very stupid is actually his pastor. <laughs> the pastor of a mega church, he doesn't know all his members, but the members know him. <laughs> Are we together? That is how serious it is that no one has been able to tell his time. I have been on several mission trips with my good brothers and sisters from the West. A team leader of the team once, because you know the country we went to is called Nepal, you know, there are people who are trying to cut the queue going to the immigration. And the leader of the team went and got hold of the one guy who was trying to guard the queue and told him, get behind there. What, what do you think you are doing, you stupid idiot? And this was a mission team leader. Are we patient with ourselves? Are we able to tame our own tongues? So James gives us Four lessons that will help us to understand the words we say or to control the words we say. Lesson number one is found in verse one and verse two. Here James says, my brethren, let not many of us become teachers, knowing that we teachers shall receive a stricter judgment 
For we all stumble in many things, and if anyone does not stumble in words, he is a perfect man, able also to bring down the whole body. Those two verses are telling us that we shall be held accountable for every word that we speak. In summary, you know the police, when they are arresting you, at least in Kenya, they will tell you every word you speak will be used against you in the court of law. So you better comply with what we are saying or what we are doing. Because many people, when they are being arrested for the criminal acts they have done, they want to abuse the police, they want to speak carelessly, so the police will be upfront to tell you every word you speak will be used against you in the court of law. And here, James is telling us that every word we speak, we are going to be held responsible for it, whoever we are. It seems that the churches to which James was writing his epistles to, he did not write to one church. You can find that in James chapter 1, verse 1 and verse 2. He wrote to several churches, but he, in some versions he calls them the tribes of Israel. Those churches, it seems that there were men in those churches that were actually appointing themselves to become teachers. They were self-appointed teachers. And the reason is that in those days, to be called a teacher was something of honor, high respect. When you are called rabbi, it means you are honored, you are respected. In the Jewish synagogues, rabbis were held in high esteem because it was believed that they were the only ones who were entrusted with expounding the Holy Scriptures. And therefore, if you are called a rabbi during the time of Jesus and the time of James, you are seen to be a very honorable person, respected, held in high esteem. And these rabbis, whenever they went into the synagogue, they wanted to be given high seats so that everybody can see them on top. When they went to banquets, they wanted to be respected. I spoke in one church in the U.S. this past June. And uh, the first thing they told me was, you don't need to put on a jacket or a tie. You can be in your jeans and your t-shirt, it's okay. The second thing was, I was to sit in the congregation until the time of speaking came. It's when I was brought in front. In Kenya, I tell you, <laughs> you're going to have trouble with bishops. <laughs> you, have, you have to acknowledge their presence. You have to recognize them. You have to give them the seats in front. And in Kenya, you don't sit like this. The bishops have to sit there. <laughs> where everyone has to see them. I'm not criticizing only the bishops in Kenya. I'm just saying that is how the synagogues were made in the days of Jesus. <laughs> we like being held in high esteem. The right reverend, the most reverend. The right reverend means there are others who are wrong reverend. <laughs> <laughs> the most reverent is because there are others who are least reverent. <laughs> least. 
But titles don't take us anywhere. In fact, in leadership, we are told the lowest level of leadership is title level. The highest level of leadership is the personhood, who you are, how you live, your character. That is the highest level of leadership. But in Kenya, we are buried into titles. I'm told in Nigeria, if you are not called, called Reverend Dr. Bishop, I <laughs> will listen to you. <laughs> in Matthew chapter 23, from verse 6 to verse 11, Jesus tells us how these rabbis loved to be esteemed in high places. And he goes on to tell us that we should not love to be called rabbis because we have one teacher, we have one Lord, we have one Father, and we have one leader, and that is Jesus. Yes. In other words, we should not take the honor that belongs to God. That's what James is telling us. Not all of us should want to become teachers. We should leave the glory and honor and praise that belong to God belong to Him. All the glory must be to the Lord. No one on earth should take glory to themselves. So we should not take on the role of teacher unless God has called us to be teachers. We should not take upon ourselves the role of pastor, like many people in Kenya, they love to be called pastors, they love to preach, when God has not called you. In 2000, I and another pastor from Kenya went for a conference in Singapore. And this pastor is a kind that loves to preach. So we were, we were invited, we went to this church, and they invite, they, you know, we just attended the conference. After the conference, we were just there. So this pastor called our, our host. By that time, I had gone to another country. <coughs> and he told our host, I want you to book me on the next flight. And our host asked him, why? And he said, in Kenya, I'm not idle like this. <laughs> I have been here for this long, and there is no even preaching engagement. And my, our host told him, maybe this is the time God wants you to learn. <laughs> maybe this is the time God wants you to humble yourself. You know, pastors, I mean Kenyans, they love preaching so much. And I've been told outside there that Africans are good preachers. <laughs> Unfortunately, we are very good preachers, but we are men and women of no godly character. Because it's only the godly character, it's only the character that will make us see God. Be ye perfect as your heavenly Father is. In Matthew chapter 7, from verse 21, Jesus said, In that day, many will come to me and will tell me, Lord, Lord, did we not perform miracles in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not heal the sick in your name? And Jesus will tell them, Away from me. You evil doers, I never knew you. Why? They performed miracles. They drove out demons. They healed the sick, but no character. No godly character. <coughs> Friends, James is challenging us that we should not just look for titles, but we should look for the calling of God upon our lives. <coughs> In verse 2, we see the explanation of verse 1. And verse 2 tells us, For we all stumble in many ways. But James goes on to say, If any of you does not stumble in what he says, that person is perfect. 
It doesn't mean that person is sinless, but it just means that person is a mature Christian. We must strive to speak words that bring comfort to others, words that bring unity. The problem we have in Kenya, the political problem we have in Kenya is because the church has failed. The problems we have in the world is because the church has failed. We need to speak out in love. We need to speak out the truth. We need to love even our enemies. We are not indispensable. We are not undisputable. We all are prone to sin. We can sin, but it's only by grace. And therefore, we should not desire even to sin, even with our, with our, with our words. Jesus summarizes this, verse 1 and verse 2, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 36 and 37. And I would like us to turn there. Matthew chapter 12, 36 and 37. But I say to you, for every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Let's go to the next lesson we can learn from James chapter 3. <clears throat> And that is the lesson on the power of the words we say. We must recognize that power. The words we say have power. What you speak, you speak miracles. What you say about yourself, you are a prophet to yourself. What you say about others, you are a prophet to others. The question is, are you a prophet of doom? Are you a prophet of righteousness? Are you a prophet of peace? Or do you just see everything negative about others? We must recognize the power of the words we say. It is either for good or for evil. <coughs> In these uh, verses, verses 3 to verse 5a, James uses two analogies. James uses two analogies. One is a bit that is put in a horse so that the rider is able to control it where it goes. The other one is the rudder that the, the, the pilot or the captain of a ship uses to control where the big ship is going. Now, we must not confuse this by saying that that bit that is put in the nose of a, a horse is the one that is controlling the horse. That is not what James is saying. Or the rudder is the one that is controlling the big ship. Are we together? Am I confusing you? <laughs> Listen. Those ones are just things that people are using to control the horse or to control the ship. <coughs> Otherwise, the horse will have that bit in the nose, and if there is no one controlling it, it can go anywhere it wants. <laughs> and the rudder can be on the ship, unless the captain or the, or the pilot is the one who is now controlling it, using it to control the ship, the ship will just be there in the water and will be floating. Are we together? So, James is not saying that the bit is what controls the horse, but the bit is what the horse rider is using to control the horse. Are we together? And the rider is what the captain of the sea, of, of the ship, or the pilot is using to control that big ship. 
Are we together? And therefore, we must understand these two analogies. We normally take it for granted that James is saying that the beat is the one that is controlling the horse. Are you getting it? I see some of you are looking at me as if you are not getting it. <laughs> you put the beat in the horse and you leave it there. So is it working without the person riding it? Because it is you who is riding the horse that knows where you want to go. And the reason you are put in the horse of the nose, in the nose of the horse, is because you, you want to control the horse. Are you together? And therefore, he uses these two analogies to say that the same way the tank, some people say it is the tank which is controlling us. No. We are supposed to control the tank. We have the power to control the tank. The tank is subject to the person who has it. And the only reason your tank is evil is because you are evil. And you are using your tank for your own evil purposes. That's what James is saying from verse 3 to verse 5 end. So, do you now understand it properly? We must control our tongue. What we say, what we intend to say, and what you don't say but you wanted to say. <laughs> we control it. And if you can control your tongue, you are going to be a mature person. Perfect. Perfect. That is the lesson we learned from, the, uh, from verses 3 to verse 5n. It is us who should control the tank. If you control your tank, it can lead you into what is acceptable in the sight of God. If you don't control your tank, it will get you into the great trouble into your great trouble. Many times politicians say one thing today and tomorrow they say, I was misquoted. <laughs> you know what they are telling us? They are telling us that when I was saying that, I was misquoting myself. <laughs> so they are the ones misquoting themselves. And when they say that, the media houses, they will repeat what they say. Christians, we should control our tongue. I have a friend, many years ago he told me, I have tried to live a holy life. I've tried to do everything possible, but I tell some little lies. Whether little or much, you have not controlled your tongue. Whatever good you say, or whatever bad you say, you say it for your own good or for your own bad. If you do good, you do it for yourself. If you do bad, you do it for yourself. In, back in the village where I grew up, there was a, a mad person. And this mad person was very friendly to the children. And he used to tell the children, whenever he met with them, that the good you do, you do for yourself. The bad you do, you do for yourself. He was mad, but he was speaking sense. <laughs> and because he was a mad person, people feared him. People didn't like him. So one woman in the village, she said, this madman, because he always went to beg things from her and from others. And she was a businesswoman. And she was roasting maize. In Kenya, we like eating roast, roasted maize. So she was roasting maize in order for her to sell so that she can get some money to live on. And this madman would come and, and tell her, the good you do, you do for yourself. The bad you do, 
you do for yourself. Can you please give me that one? <laughs> The woman got mad, got tired, got disgusted with this madman, and she said, I know what I will do. I'll finish him up. I'll put poison on one of the maids, so that when he comes, I'll give it to you, he'll eat, and he'll go to die. So he came and he told her, the good you do, you do for yourself. The bad you do, you do it for yourself. Give me that one. And the woman gave that maid she had put poison. And the madman that day did not eat the maid. He carried it. And then, because he was friendly to the children, he met children and he told them, the good you do, you do, you eat, you do it for yourself. And the bad you do, you do it for yourself. Can I give you, can I share with you this? And the two children said, yes, please. And he split it into two and gave to the two children. They ate and they died, and they were children of that mother. Oh. <laughs> the good you say, it is for your own good. And the bad you say, you may cast people. You may want to bring people down using your tongue. You are actually bringing it down on yourself. The third lesson is the tongue is an untamable source of terrible evils. Not that we cannot tame it, not that the tongue cannot be tamed, but no one has been able to tame the tongue. The tongue is like a fire. We all know that fire is good, isn't it? We need fire to cook our food. We need fire when it is cold so that we can warm ourselves. We need fire for many good reasons. But if fire is out of control, it can cause havoc, it can cause sadness, it can cause sorrow, and so on and so forth. Several years ago, one of the slums in the city of Nairobi, out, outskirts of the city of Nairobi, got fire and the whole slum was burnt to ashes. Several people died, thousands were maimed, they could not walk, they could not talk, and a lot of property was reduced to ashes because of fire. Where did that fire come from? Somebody was smoking a cigarette, and when he was done, he threw it, carelessly, and the fire caught up, and that is the trouble that we got into. Even we Christians, when you are careless in the words you speak, you are causing fire in the whole world. Kenyans, we must be careful when we are referring to our political leaders. Whether it is from your tribe or from the other tribe, they are created in the image of God, both of them. We have to desist from casting the one from the, that tribe and trying to, you know, deify the one from our tribe. All people are equal in the eyes of God. And sometimes the one you think is a devil will be in heaven. As I conclude, because of time, there are three wonders that we shall find in heaven. You have heard this before. The first, the first wonder is, when you get to heaven, you will be surprised to find people you thought they will never see heaven, they are in heaven. Yeah. <laughs> the second wonder is, you will discover that the people you expected to see in heaven are actually in hell. And the third wonder is, you will also be surprised that you yourself you are in heaven. <laughs> but you can only find yourself in heaven if you take care of the words you speak. The words you speak are very important. The words you speak 
they can actually cause peace in the world or they can cause fire in the world. We as Christians, we tolerate things like gossip, slander, deceit, half-truths, sarcastic, put down, you want to put down somebody sarcastically, yes. and so on and so forth. Yet, we are so careful about these other sins. We are so careful about committing adultery. We are so careful about stealing. We are so careful about murder. But when it comes to the tank, controlling the tank, we have not succeeded. We need to ask God to forgive us for the words we have spoken against others, for the things we have done against others, because if you do good, you do it for yourself. And if you do bad, but you see, when you have thoughts of evil thoughts in you, and you want to act in an evil way, and you want to speak in an evil way, you think you are hurting the other person. James is telling us that those who don't use their tongue properly, they actually defile themselves and then destroy others. <coughs> you are the first person that your tongue will defile, and therefore you will not be in heaven. You may be surprised you are in hell, and yet you have served God all these years. May God have mercy on us. Let us pray.